Hello, and welcome to Chapter 13, Shock of the Emergency Care and Transportation of the Sick and Injured, 12th edition. If you complete this chapter and the related coursework, you will have an understanding of the different types of shock, the process of perfusion, the signs and symptoms associated with shock, application of the assessment process with the shock patient, and the general and specific emergency care provided to patients experiencing shock. Okay, so let's get started. Shock, when you think of shock, also think of hypoperfusion. Uh, you're gonna hear those terms interchangeably often, okay? So it's defined as inadequate cellular perfusion, and any compromise in perfusion can lead to cellular injury or death, okay? And so in the early stages, the body is gonna attempt to maintain homeostasis. Diffusion is the passive process in which molecules move from an area with a higher concentration of molecules to a lower area concentration. So this is how oxygen and carbon dioxide move across the alveoli. The majority of oxygen is carried to the tissues attached to hemoglobin. Now carbon dioxide can be transported in the blood from tissues back to the lungs in three ways. So carbon dioxide could be dissolved in plasma, it could be combined with water in the form of bicarbonate and also attached to the hemoglobin. Okay, so carbon dioxide is that waste product that's released from the cells and um, can combine with water in the bloodstream to form bicarbonate, right? So just a little bit more on that. And once it reaches the lungs, the bicarbonate breaks back down into carbon dioxide and water and the carbon dioxide is then exhaled. In cases of poor perfusion, remember this is called shock, the transportation of the carbon dioxide out of the tissues will become impaired. And this results in dangerous buildup of waste products and it can cause cellular damage. So shock refers to a state of collapse and failure of the cardiovascular system that leads to inadequate circulation, okay? To protect vital organs, the body directs blood flow from organs that are more tolerant of low flow, such as, let's say, the skin and the intestines, to organs that cannot tolerate low blood flow. And these are organs such as the heart, brains, and lungs, okay? So early recognition of the signs and symptoms of shock can save lives. And shock is a life-threatening and requires immediate recognition and treatment. The cardiovascular system consists of three parts. So it consists of the pump, the container, and the contents. And so this is the heart, the blood vessels, or all the tubes in the body um, that blood goes through, and the blood. Okay, so this is a great slide. You've seen it probably already in the um, uh, body systems chapter, but uh, this is a great slide, like I said, that illustrates the cardiovascular system, and it shows those three parts. So it's showing you the heart, um, the vessels, and the blood. So the perfusion triangle. So these three parts can be referred to as the perfusion triangle, the heart, the blood vessels, and the blood. And when a patient is in shock, one or more of these three parts is not working properly. Okay, so blood pressure is the pressure of blood within the vessels at any moment, we know that. And the systolic pressure is the peak arterial pressure, and that means it's the pressure generated every time the heart contracts. Um, and then the diastolic pressure is the pressure maintained within the arteries while the heart rests between heartbeats. Pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic and the diastolic. So the systolic minus the diastolic is the pulse pressure. So let's say that somebody has a, a 140 heart or 140 systolic over 80. So the pulse pressure is going to be 140 minus 80 is going to be 60. And it signifies the amount of force the heart can generate with each contraction. So a pulse pressure less than 85 millimeters of mercury may be seen in patients with shock. So for example, this might be somebody who has a blood pressure of 110 over 90. 
Now, that pressure difference is only 20. So that can signify patients um, who may be in shock. All right, so blood flow through the capillary buds is regulated by the capillary sphincters. And this is uh, circular muscle walls that constrict and dilate. These sphincters are under a control of the autonomic nervous system, which regulates involuntary functions such as swelling and digestion. And these sphincters are also in other areas such as, and they respond to um, stimuli such as heat, cold, or the need for oxygen or the need for waste removals. And the regulation of blood flow is determined by cellular needs. So perfusion also requires adequate oxygen uh, from the lungs, nutrient in the form of glucose, and waste removal, which is uh, primarily through the lungs. Okay, so mechanisms are in place to help support the respiratory and cardiovascular system when the need for perfusion of vital organs is increased. And this includes the autonomic nervous system and hormones. Okay, so the sympathetic side of the autonomic nervous system, which is responsible for the fight or flight, will assume more control of the body's function during a state of shock. Okay, so remember we have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And the sympathetic takes over um, when the body is in the state of shock. Okay, so this response by the autonomic nervous system causes release of hormones such as epi and norepi. These hormones increase the heart um, rate and the strength of the cardiac contractions, as well as vasoconstricting uh, non-essential areas, okay? So primarily in the skin and gastrointestinal tract. And this response causes all of the signs and symptoms of shock in a patient. So let's talk about causes of shock. Now there's three of them. And remember that perfusion triangle, we could go all the way back to that because if there is a problem, it's one of those basic three things that are failing. So either you have a pump failure, you have a poor blood vessel function, or you have low fluid volume, okay? So we, um, when we look at it, we look at this illustration on the slide and it shows those three basic causes of shock, okay? super simple. It's either a pump problem, a fluid problem, or the vessels, the tube problem. And this table on the slide shows those signs of shock resulting from those three basic problems. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. So you have cardiogenic and obstructive. In obstructive, it's further broken down into tension, cardiac tamponade, and pulmonary emboli. And then in poor vessel function, you have distributive shock. Inside of distributive shock, Um, You have septic, neurogenic, anaphylactic, and um, the psychogenic shock. And then low fluid, of course, you have hypovolemic shock. Inside of hypovolemic is the hemorrhagic and the non-hemorrhagic is how it's going to be broken down. And we're just going to go through those different types of shock next. Okay, so cardiogenic shock. Remember, cardiogenic shock is the first one, and it is a pump failure problem. Cardiogenic and obstructive are a pump failure problem. Okay and it's caused by inadequate function of the heart or pump failure. And a major effect is the backup of blood into those pulmonary vessels. And the resulting buildup of pulmonary fluid is called pulmonary edema. And so a lot of times cardiogenic shock is caused simply by some type of heart failure, right? So we have some type of heart attack, perhaps. The muscle of the heart is failing, okay? And it develops when a heart cannot maintain um, that output to meet the demands of the body. So cardiac output, of course, is the volume of blood that the heart can pump per minute, and it's dependent on a bunch of factors. So the heart must be, it must have adequate strength, remember? So if the heart is uh, weakened from different heart attacks, um, then it does not uh, have that ability to contract, and that's called the myocardial contractibility. The heart must also receive adequate blood to pump, and that's the preload. It has to have the blood ready to go into those chambers. And then the resistance to the flow in the peripheral circulation must be appropriate. Okay, so the afterload must be okay. All right, so we're still talking about different types of pump failure problems. Remember, I'll go back to the slide one more time. And the next pump failure problem we're going to have is the obstructive shock. And this means 
that the pump is not able to work because of some type of obstruction, okay? So some type of obstruction is going on, and this is called by a mechanical obstruction, meaning the heart is not able to beat, but it's still the heart problem, okay? So it's not a muscle, it's not too weak, it's actually literally obstruct obstructed. And so this is, um, it, it prevents adequate flow of blood from the heart chambers, okay? So there's three of them, and it's cardiac tamponade, tension pneumo, and pulmonary emboli, and we're going to talk about that more, okay? So um, cardiac tamponade. So this is a collection of fluid between the pericardial sac and the myocardium, and that is called a, a pericardial infusion. So you have that sac that, that surrounds the heart, and there's fluid in it. And so the, literally the heart cannot, um, cannot beat, cannot contract. If the effusion becomes large enough, it can prevent the ventricles from filling, and that's a position that's a condition called cardiac tamponade. It's caught it can be caused by a blunt or penetrating trauma that causes the hemorrhage around that heart inside the sac. The signs and symptoms of cardiac tamponade are referred to Beck's triad. So when you think about cardiac tamponade, you really need to think about Beck's triad. So there's three things, hence the triad. The first one is the presence of the jugular vein distension. And obviously, the blood can't get, can't return from that superior vena cava, so it's backing up into those jugular veins. You're also going to hear muffled heart tones because there's fluid in that sac, so it's going to make them muffled. And then, of course, the narrowing pulse pressures where the systolic and diastolic begin to, um, to merge. Okay, so that's called narrowing pulse pressures. So first thing of the obstructive shock is we have cardiac tamponade. The next one is the pneumo. So this is caused by air um, that has damaged the lung tissue, and the air normally is held within the lung, escapes into the chest cavity, and so the lung collapses. If the pneumo is left untreated, air will accumulate in that chest, ca chest cavity and apply pressure to the organs, and this is including the heart and the vessels. And so when that air has um, uh, put enough pressure on the heart, the heart is uh, going to be a, not going to be able to be just like in the uh, cardiac tamponade and um and so you have that um uh, obstructive shock from the tension pneumo okay then there's the third one third obstructive type shock and that is the pulmonary emboli so this is basically just a blood clot when you see the embolism you think clot and it occurs in the pulmonary circulation that blocks the flow of blood through the pulmonary vessels okay so when a massive pulmonary emboli occurs, it can prevent blood from being pumped from the right side of the heart into the left, resulting in a complete backup of blood in the right ventricle and leading to catastrophic obstructive shock and complete pump failure. All right, so that was the um, cardiogenic shock. And uh, now we're going to move into distributive shock, okay? So here we are, distributive shock. Um, this is because of the poor vessel function. So now we're into the, the vessels. This is actually the tubes of the cardiovascular system is what we're talking about, okay? Distributive shock, this results in when there's some type of widespread dilation of those small arterioles, small venules, or maybe both. And the circulation of blood pools into the expanded vascular beds and the tissue perfusion decreases, okay? So distributive shock, remember, there's different types of distributive shock, and we'll go back up to the slide. There's septic, neuro, anaphylactic, and psychogenic. Okay, so we're going to talk about the four of those next. Septic shock, and um, it occurs as a result of a severe infection, usually bacteria in which toxins are generated by bacteria or by infected body tissues. Okay, so what you have is widespread dilation of those vessels combined with plasma loss through the injured vessel walls. And because of the, the decrease um, in that fluid, you're going to result in shock. Okay, and that's the same, same thing that the last slide just shows. All right, so neurogenic shock is the next type of distributive shock. Remember, there's four of them. And this is usually a result of some type of spinal cord injury. 
basically the muscles of the in the walls of the blood vessels are cut off from that nervous system and nerve impulses that cause them to contract. And so what's going to happen is all the vessels below that level of the spinal cord injury are going to dilate widely, increasing the size and capacity of the vascular system. And of course, then blood is going to pool. You're going to lose, um, lose the, the good container, right? So you're going to lose that. Next, we have anaphylactic shock. This is that third type of shock. It occurs when a person reacts violently to a substance to which he or she has been sensitized. So um, sensitization means becoming sensitive to that substance that they did not initially cause a reaction. And then each, each time they are exposed to that sensitization, it tends to produce, produce a more severe reaction, okay? So this table on the slide lists the signs and symptoms of the anaphylactic shock. Okay, and then the fourth and final type of distributive shock of the vessel problem is going to be the psychogenic shock. And this is when a patient is in... Um, uh, when they're in psychogenic shock, they've had some type of sudden reaction of the nervous system that produces a temporarily uh, generalized vascular dilation, and usually they'll have a sinkable episode. Okay. Um, usually, life threatening causes include some type of irregular heartbeat or some type of brain aneurysm, but you also have non life threatening left life threatening events which include um, maybe hearing some bad noise or bad new news or experiencing fear or unpleasant sights such as some type of blood. Okay. okay, now we move into the fluid issue, right? So now we have the fluid problems. And um, so the, the, the one that we're going to talk about is hypovolemic shock. And of course, there's two. There's hemorrhagic and non-hemorrhagic. And we'll get into those next. But um, the result is obviously an inadequate amount of fluid or volume in that circulatory system. So this is the blood part, um, the third third thing, right? So you have the, the pump problem, vessel problem, and now the blood problem, okay? So this occurs with um, usually um, uh, some thermal burns. You could have thermal burns. And we'll talk about the different types. Okay. All right. So you have stages of shock. So the different stages of shock. Okay. So you have the compensated where the body's able to compensate. Then you have the decompensate. And then once shock has progressed too far, um, it becomes irreversible. So no way to assess when the patient has reached this point. Just you, that's why we need to recognize and treat shock very early, um, well before the patient transforms into this decompensated state, okay? The table on the slide lists the signs and symptoms of compensated versus decompensated shock, so very good to get to know those different signs, okay? All right, so blood pressure will be the last measurable factor to change with shock. And so when the blood pressure is evident, um, shock has well developed, okay? When a drop in blood pressure, when you see that. So this is particularly true in infants and children who can maintain their pressure um, until they have blood loss that is more than half their blood volume, okay? So by the time pressure drops in infants and children who are in shock, they're pretty close to death, okay? Um, so expect shock in many emergency medical situations. Also expect shock if a patient has one of the following conditions. So say that they have multiple fractures or some type of abdominal or chest injury, spinal injury, severe infection, a heart attack, or anaphylaxis. Okay. All right. So now we're just going to go through um, how you treat the patient. So we're going to start off with the scene size up, of course, and uh, make sure that the scene's safe, and then try and determine that mechanism of injury or nature of illness. Then do that primary assessment. And when you suspect some type of shock, you should probably do a, a rapid exam. All right. So we're going to do a real rapid exam. And we want to determine the LOC, level of consciousness, and um, identify and treat any of those life threatening concerns first. Okay. So determine the priority of the patient transport. If, if there's a massive hemorrhage, uh, you may be required to put on that tourniquet. Remember? direct pressure dressings, 
when tourniquets are not feasible or available. So before the airway is opened, um, you should stop that bleeding. So if the patient has life-threatening external hemorrhage, it should be addressed first, um, like I said, even before the airway. Then the ABCs must be assessed and treated and, um, uh, and treatments for shock provided. So provide high flow of two to, to assist with perfusion of damaged um, tissues. If the patient has signs of hypoperfusion, you need to treat aggressively and provide rapid transport. So request an advanced life support as necessary to assist with more aggressive shock management. All right, and then of course our general impression. We're gonna determine the need for spinal immobilization and we're going to do airway and breathing. So we need to assess the airway to ensure that it's patent and it quickly assess the breathing. And then of course there's a circulation and we're gonna assess the patient's circulatory status um, to see if there's any clues regarding the presence of shock, okay? We're gonna check for the distal pulse. If there is none, check for the central, remember the carotid, and determine if the pulse is fast, slow, weak, strong, or altogether absent. A rapid pulse suggests compensated shock. So in shock or compensated shock, the skin may be cool, clammy, or ashen. And if the patient has no pulse and is not breathing, of course, we're going to begin CPR and assess for and identify any life threats, um, bleeding and trauma patients. And we're going to treat it immediately, of course. Um, so quickly assess skin color, temp condition, and check for cap refill. Okay, our determination of our transport. So we're going to determine whether the, the patient should be treated as high priority, whether advanced life support is needed, and which facility to transport to. All right, so after um, that, we're going to do history taking, and after life threats have been managed, um, determine the chief complaint, of course, and then obtain a sample history. We're going to do the secondary assessments, and this includes a physical exam. So we're going to repeat the primary assessment followed by a focused assessment. And the secondary four trauma is going to be a focused assessment, okay? And so we're going to perform it of the entire body. And we're going to, um, to look uh, very closely if, if our trauma patient has any significant illness or injury, okay? And um, we're going to do this if the patient gives you a poor general impression or you find problems in the primary assessment or if your patient has a medical problem but it's not responsive, or if your patient has problems that were not noted in the primary assessment. These assessments should be performed quickly but thoroughly to ensure that you did not miss any significant or life-threatening problems or delay needed care. So whether your examination is, is of the entire body system or a specific area, um, if the life-threatening problem is found, so treat it immediately, okay? And then you're gonna do the vital signs. And then we're going to reassess the patient. So we're going to reassess the patient's vital signs, interventions, chief complaint, ABCs, and mental status. Then we're going to determine what interventions are needed for the patient based on the assessment findings. Okay, so we're going to focus on supporting the cardiovascular system. We're going to treat for shock early and aggressively by providing oxygen and keeping the patient warm. That's how we treat for shock, remember? All right, so emergency care for shock. We're going to begin immediate treatment for shock as soon as we recognize the condition exists. We're going to follow local precautions, control all external bleeding, obvious external bleeding, make sure the patient has an open airway, and then inline, maintain inline stabilization if necessary. We're going to comfort, calm, and reassure the patient while maintaining the patient in the supine position. We're never going to allow the patients to eat or drink prior to being evaluated by a physician. So no food or drink. And of course, if C-spine is indicated, we're going to uh, um, put the patient on the backboard, okay? And we need to remember that adequate ventilation may be a major factor in the development of shock. So we have to provide oxygen assistance sometimes and use um, airway adjuncts when needed. We have to prevent body loss by placing blankets under and, and over the patient. And we need to transport the patient and treat additional injuries en route. And then consider rendezvous of advanced life support if possible and consider um, a helicopter, aeromedical if needed.
accurately record the patient's vital signs appropriately every five minutes throughout treatment and transport. Okay, so specifically cardiogenic shock, uh, how are we going to treat these patients? And this is a result of that, it could be a result of the heart attack um, and because it cannot generate the necessary power to pump. And so usually patients with cardiogenic shock, they do not have an injury, but they may have um, chest pain. And patients with cardiogenic shock should not receive nitro um, if they are hypotensive, remember? Okay, so signs and symptoms of that cardiogenic shock are going to be a lot of times low blood pressure or a weak irregular pulse, cyanosis around the lips or under the fingernails, anxiety and nausea. So we want to place these guys in the position that eases the breathing and give them a high flow O2 and then uh, initiate prompt transport and advanced life support. If they're not already on scene, we should consider rendezvousing with them en route. Then how are we going to treat obstructive shock? So for cardiac tamponade, we're going to incre um, increase in cardiac output should be the priority. So we want to try and give them high flow oxygen and they're going to need surgery. That's the only definitive treatment. Okay. And then for tension pneumo, of course, that uh, the next obstructive shock, we are going to give them high flow two in a non rebreather to try and prevent that hypoxia. Um, chest decompression is required to relieve that pressure. However, um, that's an advanced life support skill. And so you should try and get ALS there assistance early in the call if available because um, uh, they're going to need to get that, like I said, the um, chest decompression, but do not delay transport um, to wait for them, okay? Okay, so treating septic shock. Um, this requires hospital management, including antibiotics. So we want to use standard precautions because of um, um, any type of risk of infections and uh, um, transport promptly. So give them high flow of two and possibly support the ventilations with a BVM, preserve the body heat and notify a specialized sepsis team if available to meet the patient in the emergency department room. So emergency treatment, we're going to um, obtaining and maintaining, of course, proper airway, C-spine maybe, and assisting inadequate breathing, conserving body heat, and ensure the most effective uh, circulation possible. Okay, so we're going to transport the patient promptly to the facility capable of managing, um, oh, neurogenic shock. Now we're on neurogenic shock. Okay. And then now we're moving into anaphylactic shock. So the most effective treatment for a severe acute allergic reaction is to administer epi um, by the way of an IM, intramuscular. So that's for anaphylaxis. So a patient with anaphylaxis requires immediate transport, high flow O2, possibly assistance with a BVM, and try to find out what caused the reaction and how it was received, okay? So keep in mind that a mild reaction may worsen suddenly. Um, so just because of the potential for airway compromise, you might want to request an advanced life support backup as soon as possible. And then the psychogenic shock. So in any uncomplicated case of fainting, once a patient collapses and becomes supine, of course, the circulation to the brain is restored and with that, a normal state of functioning. So psychogenic shock could worsen other types of shock, but if it appears that the patient fell as a result of the psychogenic shock, just check for injuries, especially in older patients. So if the patient reports not being able to walk after the fall, though it is related to psychogenic shock, you should suspect another problem, maybe like a head injury or a hip injury. So transport promptly. And all patients with lots of consciousness should be transported to the emergency department for an evaluation, even if they appear normal once we arrive on scene. All right, and then the last type of shock, um, treating hypovolemic shock. And so obvious, you're going to stop that external bleeding. That's the first thing you want to do. And the best initial method, of course, uh, is direct pressure. And then if, if direct pressure does not work, you're going to use a tourniquet, okay? So handle the patient gently and keep them warm and recognize internal bleeding and provide aggressive general support, okay? So secure and maintain an airway and provide respiratory support if needed, including oxygen and, of course, ventilations. So transport the patient as rapidly as you can 
to the emergency department. Treating shock in older patients. So older patients generally have more serious complications than younger. And so many older patients uh, take numerous medications. And this could either mask or mimic signs of shock. So treating a patient uh, pediatric or geriatric in shock is no different, of course, no different than treating any other shock patient. We need to provide inline uh, spinal stabilization and um, if it's not indicated, maintain the patient in a, a position of comfort, okay? So control life-threatening hemorrhages immediately with direct pressure, then suction as necessary, and provide high-flow oxygen as uh, via non-rebreather mask. We want to maintain body temp, as with all of these patients, and then rapid transport with all of the patients, once again. All right. So that concludes the information portion of this uh, slide uh, or lecture, and we're going to go ahead and start talking about the review questions, okay, see how much we've learned. So the term shock is most accurately defined as, what do we know? What do we know? It is hypoperfusion. So when you hear shock, think hypoperfusion, and that's that state of collapse of the cardiovascular system. Okay, anaphylactic shock is typically associated with, all right, I think it's probably urticaria. Localized welts would be a mild, severe headache. Mm, they could, but not usually. Yep, urticaria, and that's hives. And it's a, a, a allergic reactions, um, all different types, okay, caused by those histamines. Signs of compensated shock include all of the following except... Okay. I think it's a feeling of impending doom. Nope. Compensated shock is the body, um, basically, they're able to maintain perfusion. Um, so the only one would be weak or absent peripheral pulses, and that is probably decompensated shock, okay? When treating a trauma patient who's in shock, lowest priority should be given to so trauma patient, I think it's splinting hot fractures, right? Because we're going to do all the other thing. Yep, yeah? splinting fractures is a secondary, uh, secondary uh, issue. Right, potential causes of cardiogenic shock include all but the following. Okay, so inadequate heart function, yes. Disease of the muscle tissue, yes. Impaired electrical system, yes. Usually the bacteria infection is going to be a distributive, right? So that's a distributive issue. Okay. 60 year old woman who presents of 80 over 60, okay? So that's only a 20 point different, a pulse rate of 110 and model skin, and the temp of 103. Okay. So the temperature is the key thing here. And when you see that temp, you're going to think septic shock. She's got some type of infection. And she's in shock because we know because of the blood pressure. Okay, so septic shock. All right, a patient with neurogenic shock would least likely present with tachypnea, so breathing fast, yes. Hypotension, yes. Tachycardia, I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no, because usually the signal will not get to the heart. Perfect. So it's, um, remember that sympathetic nervous system is compromised. It's not going to be able to, um, to know that it needs the epi or norepi, right? And so tachycardia is the correct answer with neurogenic shock. All right. 20-year-old is kicked in the belly during an assault. His abdomen is rigid and tender, heart rate 120, and respirations of 30. How should we treat this patient? Okay, so the, what I'm going to say is, let's see, where in the belly? doesn't say. I'm thinking a liver or spleen. And it's because they're bleeding, so both. It could be both. There you go. And so we could just go with the hypovolemic. So the liver laceration and the ruptured spleen could both cause hypovolemic shock. So that's the answer. 33-year-old woman who has a rash, facial swelling, and hypotension 10 minutes after being stung. There you go. She is in anaphylactic shock. 
we've given her high flow too. She needs epi. Epi's going to do the exact opposite of what um, of what that just did. So it's epi is going to reverse all of those bad things. Okay, all of the following are potential causes of impaired tissue perfusion, except so right away increased number of red blood cells is not going to do it. We know it's a pump volume or vessel problem. So A is the correct answer. Okay, so this concludes chapter 13 shock lecture. So if you like this, um, this lecture, go ahead and uh, subscribe to the channel. We're going to put out all of the chapters in this book within the next couple weeks. All right, have a great day.